வெல்கம் டு இன்போ ஃபயர் த ஃபயர் சைட் சேட் சீரீஸ் ஃப்ரம் இன்ஃபர்மேஷன் மேட்டர்ஸ் இன்போ ஃபயர் பிரிங்ஸ் விஷனரிஸ் அண்ட் எக்ஸ்பர்ட்ஸ் ஃப்ரம் டைவர்ஸ் டொமைன்ஸ் டு ஷேர் தர் பர்ஸ்பெக்டிவ்ஸ் ஆன் எ சோசன் டாபிக் ஈச் எபிசோட் இஸ் அ கான்வர்சேஷன் பிட்வீன் அவர் கெஸ்ட் அண்ட் த ஹோஸ்ட் ஐ எம் ஷாலினி அரஸ் யுவர் ஹோஸ்ட் ஃபார் த சீரீஸ் ஐ எம் அன் அகாடமிக் வித் மோர் தென் ஃபோர் டிகேட்ஸ் ஆஃப் எக்ஸ்பீரியன்ஸ் இன் டீச்சிங் அண்ட் ரிசர்ச்சிங் இன்ஃபர்மேஷன் ஐ ஃபவுண்டட் டூ எஜுகேஷனல் இன்ஸ்டிடியூஷன்ஸ் த ஃபர்ஸ்ட் இஸ் தி இன்டர்நேஷ்னல் ஸ்கூல் ஆஃப் இன்ஃபர்மேஷன் மேனேஜ்மெண்ட் அட் தி யூனிவர்சிட்டி ஆஃப் மைசோர் த ஃபர்ஸ்ட் ஐ ஸ்கூல் இன் இண்டியா இன் த 2005 with a seed grant from the Ford Foundation in 2012 I founded the Myra School of Business with a focus on triple bottom line in this episode of info fire I am in conversation with professor Tony Hay professor Tony Hay CBE fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering fellow of the Association for Computing Machinery and a chartered engineer He is currently Honorary Senior Data Scientist, Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, Howell Campus, UK. The topic of our conversation is AI for Science. Let me first briefly introduce Tony Hay. Professor Tony Hay studied theoretical physics at Oxford University and then received his doctorate in theoretical particle physics under P.K. Kabir also at Oxford and spent in the two years as a postdoctoral fellow at Caltech with Nobel laureates Richard Feynman and Murray Gell-Mann and then a further two years at CERN in Geneva. Tony Hay's career has spanned the gamut from physics to computer science to engineering. He began his academic career in 1974 in the physics department of the University of Southampton in UK and later moved to a new combined electronics and computer science department at Southampton with its world renowned Opto Electronics Research Center one of the original three research groups pioneering the use of optical fibers for telecommunications Dr Hay was the head of the department of electronics and computer science and later became the dean of the faculty of engineering and applied science Tony Hay's parallel computing research group which was instrumental in designing novel transputer based parallel computing system is one of the leading hardware and software groups worldwide Dr Hay has co-authored the first draft of the MPI message passing standard he spent sabbaticals at MIT Caltech IBM research and Los Alamos National Laboratory He was the director of the UK E-Science Initiative, UK Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council during 2000 to 2005. From 2005 to 14, Tony Hay worked at Microsoft Corporation and later became Vice President Microsoft Research. He was Senior Data Science Fellow at the E-Science Institute of the University of Washington, USA. He moved to STFC Science and Technology Facilities Council as Chief Data Scientist in 2050. He is the co-author of the best-selling graduate text on gauge theories in particle physics and popular science books on quantum mechanics and relativity such as The Quantum Universe, The New Quantum Universe, Einstein's Mirror, The Computing Universe, A Journey Through a Revolution, all published by the Cambridge University Press. Tony Hay has popularized the term The Fourth Paradigm and co-edited the well-known book The Fourth Paradigm Data Intensive Scientific Discovery, a book of essays inspired by Microsoft Jim Gray, who saw science paradigm shift in 2009. He recently, 2023, edited the 25th anniversary edition of the Feynman Lectures on Computation earlier published in 1996. Tony Hay was one of the invited participants at the first edition of Spark's Serendipity Forum at CERN in 2021. Professor Hay has held and continues to hold several key positions such as member Department of Electronics Advanced Scientific Computing Advisory Committee Trustee American Universities Inc Member University of Oxford Research Committee 
editor, concurrency in computation, practice and experience at Wiley. Let me now chat with Professor Tony Hay and get his perspectives on AI for science. Hi Tony, welcome to InfoFire, the Fireside Chat series from Information Matters. It's a privilege and an absolute honor to have this Fireside Chat with you. Thank you so very much for this privilege and opportunity. No, th thank you for inviting me. It's uh, it's it's nice to be able to uh, talk about things one cares about. Thank you. I'm glad that you mentioned about the caring about it because I would like to begin this fireside chat by quoting Richard Feynman, Nobel laureate, and under whom you did your postdoc at Caltech. Yes. Because for me, I think the progress in science starts with passion for science. So one of my favorite quotes about the beauty or the passion for science is by Richard Feynman. He, to counter the argument of, you know, artists and uh, creative people who think or who consider science to be reductionist and takes away the beauty uh, of nature, etc. Richard Feynman said, and I quote, I can appreciate the beauty of a flower. At the same time, I can see more. I can imagine the cells, the complicated actions in there, which are beautiful too. All kinds of interesting questions that science finds answers to add to the excitement, the mystery and the awe of a flower. It only adds, it does not subtract. I think it beautifully captures the beauty of science. Okay. And you have recently published the 25th anniversary edition of the Feynman Lectures on Computation. And you did your PhD under P.K. Kabir at Oxford and then your postdoctoral at Caltech with Nobel laureates, of course, Richard Feynman and Murray Gilman. So my question is, who ignited this passion for science in you? Who are the, apart from Feynman, of course, who are the people who ignited this passion for science? Well, it, it, it's, it's an interesting question. I, I, I actually was very interested in, in, in astronomy and astrophysics and things when I was a teenager. And uh, Fred Hoyle uh, wrote a book. Um, he gave some lectures on the BBC. Uh, uh, it was the nature of the universe or something like that. And, and they were really stunning things. And I got very excited. And um, Fred Hoyle and, and science fiction was one of the ways that I got excited. And then I read um, a little book about, you know, Plain Man's Guide to Relativity was one of them. And then uh, a book by Banish Hoffman, the uh, strange story of the quantum and so i got interested in quantum mechanics and relativity which were totally different ways of looking at the world and and they became what i wanted to do and so that's the start of it and then uh, i went to oxford to do physics and i chose going to oxford rather than cambridge because i had a choice uh, in Cambridge, I'd have had to do a natural science tripos with chemistry and physics and crystallography, the whole lot of things. But in Oxford, I could focus on physics, and that's why I went to Oxford and, and did physics as an undergraduate. And I learned about Feynman's big red books, the Feynman lectures of, of, of on, on physics, and they they were widely admired by people, and I dipped into them and I found them interesting, but uh, I didn't have time to read them at the time. But now I do appreciate them and I think they're, they're a wonderful series and a, a great bit of Feynman's legacy. Okay, thank you. So you were trained as a theoretical physicist at Oxford and then transitioned to computer science. And of course, you have been championing the advancement of science and technology for the good of humanity in diverse ways. Apart from your contributions, which are immense, of course, in terms of hundreds of research papers and a dozen books, you have shaped science policies and steered its course as the director of UK e-science initiative. And you have continued your good work 
in many different ways in many different institutions and organizations. So I would say you have successfully straddled the world of academia, government and corporations across continents. Please share the highlights of your professional career crossing disciplines, continents and sectors. Could you please highlight the pushes and pushbacks in terms of the ethos of these organizations in propelling science? Very good. So I started off by doing a PhD at Oxford and uh, um, I started off uh, wanting to do uh, experimental particle physics. Um, but I was full of enthusiasm for for learning more about relativity and, and um, the things like the relativistic equation, the Dirac equation uh, of the uh, uh, relativistic electrons and the positrons and so on. And um, I found that the experimental scientists who gave lectures to us were intimidated by the theoretical framework of quantum field theory, which is how you describe um, once you can create particles, you no longer have a single particle equation, you have multi-particles. And so dealing with multiple particles where you can create electron-positron pairs and so on, you need to have a new formalism called quantum field theory. And, and they were not very interested. So I switched from um, when I was... Um, uh, I, I realized that I'd made a mistake doing experimental because I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do the theory applied to experimental, which uh, I'll come back to in a moment. So that's why I changed to theoretical physics with um, Pasha Kabir, who who was uh, um, my th thesis advisor, as you can see. And so that was a, a, an exciting time. But more exciting was when I went to Caltech. And Caltech does have two Nobel Prize winners at the time, Feynman and Gell-Mann, as you said. And um, first of all, Oxford, I thought, was a significant place for physics and was the world least revolved a little bit around Oxford. But when I went to Caltech, as far as Caltech was concerned, Europe hardly existed, let alone Oxford, right? So it was a very big change. And furthermore, uh, they were interested in solving real significant problems which are, would, would really change the way you looked at si particle physics theory. And I'd done some good work. I, I, I was technically very competent, but I had to address problems, which I wrote a paper with an experimentalist, actually. Um, a friend of mine, Roger Cashmore, became a, a, a director at, at CERN at one point. Um, and it was correcting a, a, a mistake in a paper which was being used by experimentalists to analyze their data. And I, I wrote this paper up at Caltech and I gave it to a colleague there, um, a man who's not very, very well known, but actually his name was George Zweig. And he invented, along with Gell-Mann, independently, the quark model that we all now uh, accept. Uh, and and he looked at my paper and read it and, and said gave it me back and he said well it's fine but we do understand rotational invariance because it was all about complicated things uh, and um that was a big big uh, revelation to me that really you in order to interest the people like Gelman and Feynman you had to be working on problems that were not solved that were not just people making complications from from uh, theory we understood and so that was a big big shot and and I was very fortunate to work with some of the the visiting uh professors there and 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 associate professors uh, and a man named Jeffrey Fox and and Jeffrey had this vision that really what he wanted to do was apply theory to data and he called that phenomenology and I would say that's what I've been doing all my life understanding the theory but checking it out against experiment and that you have to go and do some measurements and you have to actually go and do some calculations to see how they fit the measurements and so on from the experimentalists. And, and um, interestingly enough, um, if you read about Beta, Hans Beta and, and Feynman, at, for example, they were together at Cornell and also before that at Los Alamos, um, 
their essence of, of science was that you didn't really understand something unless you could calculate and compare with experiment. And so in some sense, Feynman and Beta uh, were phenomenologists too. And I that's what I prefer doing as opposed to something very abstract like string theory, which is very mathematical and has very little potential to connect to experimental data. So that was... Uh, you know, one of the the major things that that um, ignited my Fed Hoyle initially, and then obviously when going to Caltech after my PhD, I got a whole new education in science, and that was very exciting. And then, if just to, just to conclude this, I, I was doing theoretical physics uh, as an undergraduate and graduate, so from sixty four until about um, twenty years later, when we'd actually. Um, more or less understood where theoretical particle physics because we had quantum chromodynamics which was like quantum electrodynamics uh, and and we also had a, a unification of the electron electro weak theory so we had a standard model uh, and uh, i was there on sabbatical in 1981 at caltech and i went to a, a colloquium uh, by by a man named Carver Mead. He was the Gordon Moore Professor of Computing at Caltech. And he was the man who understood why Moore's law worked. Mm -hmm. That, And he gave this wonderful lecture uh, in 1981 saying um, there were no engineering, I remember distinctly, he said there were no engineering obstacles to things getting smaller, faster uh, and cheaper for the next 20, 20 years. And in fact, it was more than that. It was about 30 years. So that was what convinced me that we needed to go to a different way of doing things uh, in computing. And I've been starting to do computational solutions of quantum chromodynamics on a computer. And I didn't have a big enough computer. And the big enough computer was when you did parallel processing. And Carver Mead was the man who started me doing parallel processing by that, that lecture. And I moved over became more interested in the computing than the, the physics at the time. And, and that's the reason why I moved to computer science. So lots of people had an impact, but I would say that um, uh, obviously Feynman and Gell-Mann, uh, George Zweig, um, Jeffrey Fox and Carver Mead were influential. And in computer science, when I got back to England, um, there was this amazing chip called the transputer which was made by Inmos, where you could actually connect them together very easily. And they're on the same chip. You had two processors, a floating point processor and a central processor. You also had memory. You also had communication hardware. And that was, a, I think it was many years ahead of its time. But that was what we used to build one of the first parallel processing uh, distributed memory computers. And that was a big, big change. And that eventually took over from the big supercomputers, which were um, very expensive, much nothing I could afford, but I could afford to buy these small parallel computers, which were very powerful. So Carver Mead, not Carver Mead, um, Seymour Cray, who did the supercomputers, said, oh, it's like, um, instead of having an ox to pull a plow, you have, you know, a hundred rabbits. But actually, in the end, the rabbits win if you can program them. And, and that's what we showed. And now every computer at the supercomputer stage is actually these parallel processing units. Okay. Thank you for sharing your personal journey interwoven it's with a yeah. long journey. Yes, long it is. journey interwoven with the you know the way in which uh, from theoretical physics uh, to but I mean parallel computing to the little rabbits winning. So now let's yes. come back to the AI a part of it, and particularly again going back to uh, Richard Feynman and your uh, latest uh, edition of the book, uh, because the topic today uh, of our conversation is AI. There is an article which is included in this uh, new edition of the Feynman Lectures on Computation, that is Feynman and AI and Machine Learning. So could you throw some light on, from Feynman's yes. view, AI? 
Yes, I, I, I mean, Feynman, just before he died, asked me if I'd write up his lectures because he didn't like writing up the lectures, but he did definitely want them written up. <laughs> and these were quite complicated because uh, they covered a huge range of, of, of stuff and a couple of people had tried to do bits before. But um, it, he asked me if I would put it all together and I agreed. But then he died a few months later, which was very sad because I would have liked to interact with him, him more. Um, so um, he got very excited. I mean, his interest in computation actually started from the very beginning. He was always interested in computers and making things, calculations. So at, at Los Alamos, he, he led the, the computer team, which was not really computers. It was you know adding machines and things like this to do the final calculations for the atomic bomb, uh, for the implosion bomb that you had to make. Uh, and... Uh, He'd, he'd been interested in computers for many years uh, and he, he he switched to computing for the last five years of his life. He lectured on computing and that was his main interest. Uh, and on the lecture notes, uh, if, you, if you go through them, they're, they're very unusual. Uh, they cover a lot of the basic stuff of, of a typical computer science course, but also rather unusual things like Instead of the, the logic gates like and and or and nor and so on, uh, you, you had reversible gates like the controlled not, the controlled, controlled not, which I'd never heard of. And, and so you had these reversible gates, which he was then going to use later to do uh, his, an analysis of energy and an analysis of uh, quantum computing, which come, comes later. So he did a lot of work on that. And... Um, one of the teaching assistants on the course um, was uh, a graduate student at Caltech uh, called Eric Majolsness. And he was being supervised by uh, John Hopfield, a professor there, who had this neural network uh, model for computing, for storing data and so on, and retrieving data. And, and so there was an interest in neural networks. And Feynman, when he was putting this lecture course together, um, there was a visitor from MIT because he'd lectured a few years before uh, and had lots of visitors come and give special lectures. So people like Marvin Minsky from MIT came and gave a lecture course and, uh, and explained his views on artificial intelligence and so on. Uh, and and people like Charles Bennett uh, came and gave lectures. He's from IBM, and he gave lectures on reversible computing and things. So Feynman had learned a lot before, uh, but Jerry Sussman was a professor at MIT with Minsky, and he came out to Caltech for a sabbatical and agreed to work with Feynman on the lecture course. So it was jointly done with originally with Jerry Sussman. And Jerry Sussman was a traditional uh, symbolic AI. So he believed in AI. He, he worked with Minsky. And um, Feynman was very suspicious of that. And, and uh, uh, what Eric records in the the new chapter that we included in the new edition was was about Feynman's arguments and, and interest in neural networks as opposed to the symbolic artificial intelligence that was at that time very popular in the computer science community. So there's a lot of discussions that took place and it turns out that Eric um, is now a professor of his own at UC Irvine and he works on uh, neural networks applied to science problems and things like that. So so Eric was just the right person because he'd been at the lectures. He'd actually attend. Typically after the lecture, Feynman would give a lecture and then they'd all go over the teaching assistants and grad students to have lunch at the, the local cafeteria on the campus, the Greasy, we used to call it. And uh, lots of discussions took place and arguments and so on. And it was a when Feynman was there, it was always very exciting with Feynman in the, leading, leading the discussion. So when I was there uh, as a postdoc, we used to be at the table, and, and many people now have read the stories in Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. Well, he told those stories at lunchtime to us in those years. They weren't recorded then. And as always, you know, there was a table with Feynman and us and lots of other people in the cafeteria, and they were all sort of listening to the conversation. So it was a very exciting time, and, and having Feynman around uh, always made it interesting. But 
he never actually gave lectures on AI and neural networks, but he did have an interest in them. And that's what we try to capture in this chapter by Eric in the new edition. So Feynman then only had, I mean, bet on uh, neural networks rather than the symbolic uh, approach. Right? Yes, yes, I think he did. And you, you'll <laughs> find that he had an interest in neural networks. Thank but uh, I, I, th I th yeah, maybe that was just... Uh, yeah. Maybe that was intuition, or maybe it was just luck. But but nonetheless, that is now um, yeah. the current the current, uh, current uh, revolution or uh, something that is revolutionizing AI, right? The deep learning revolution, deep I call learning. it. Yes, that's right. Yes, and uh, it, it's it's a very exciting thing, and we'll come back to that later on because yeah. you know. Uh, it's currently one of my interests. <laughs> so now from AI to move back to AI for science, that is science. Well, you led the UK uh, science uh, e-science initiative and also co-edited the book, The Fourth Paradigm, Data Intensive Scientific Discovery, which was published in 2009. Of course, wherein you outlined how the increasing use of data engenders a paradigm shift to the nature of science itself. Which, of course, based on uh, Jim Gray's, how he imagined the new fourth paradigm of distributed computing and data deluge, etc. Right? Now, the whole premise of that fourth paradigm, of course, it's now proved to be that is the paradigm. I agree there. That it, uh, the question to you is, has it dramatically transformed science? That is the new research. Because okay. you yourself said, you know, like, uh, yes, we agree that, you know, modeling is, uh, I mean, uh, the, I would say the essence of computational uh, science, simulation and modeling. Don't you still agree that theories and empirical data are the cornerstones of science? Yeah, yes. Uh, okay. So let, let, let's, let's, let's be quite clear. When I was doing the e-science program, it was called e-science, not by me, but by, by my boss. And he defined e-science as, as about these big data activities. But, but actually, I would call it data science. Big data was the key thing and handling big data no longer could, 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 people go away from their experiment with all the data on a little USB stick because the data that they took was much too big and they had to go back with arms full of, of, of terabyte disks and things. And then they got back to their university having taken this data at this facility and, and there was nowhere to store it. Just managing this data was a challenge. And Jim Gray had seen that that the, his, his technique was to find an experimentalist who was drowning in data basically, mm -hmm. and and didn't know how to organize it. And so, uh, obviously, there was the empirical way of finding out science, which was the observation like the like, like the Greeks and, 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 and before looking at the stars and stuff like that. Uh, and then there was with Maxwell and Newton uh, and and later on with Schrodinger, there was the theoretical uh, uh, way of attacking problems so you could actually do calculations of what it would be like even if you couldn't do the experiment and so the combination of experiment and theory was the way we'd done science um, up to you know up to the last century but then in 1950 we invented computers all right and and what ken wilson the nobel prize winner himself from cornell recognized that with computers you could do other things you could go and explore in other ways how things could evolve and and um, things that you couldn't measure, but you could actually simulate, you could uh, 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 complement what you'd learnt from experiment and theory with simulation. And so uh, the third paradigm, which was what Ken Wilson called it, was computation. And uh, that clearly made a huge difference. Uh, and you train people in in you know parallel computing, computing languages, uh, and and all the analysis tools that you use for simulation and modeling, computational simulation and modeling. But what that didn't capture was what you needed when you had huge amounts of data. You needed people who knew about how to handle data, how to how to move a terabyte, how to move a petabyte, how to organize it, how to reorganize it. 
you use a relational database? Do you not use a relational database? How you visualize it? And that's a different set of skills than someone who knows how to parallelize a, a computer code. And so it, it's a different set of skills. And that's what that's what Jim called the fourth paradigm. It was not my my name. It was Jim Gray's name. But I think it's correct. So you don't have, it doesn't replace the previous ones, but it's a different type of skill. You have to train people in order to manage data and the importance of metadata, as we'll come to later, is vital if you want to be able to do that. Just putting data and not putting labels on, you won't know what you're doing a few years down the line. And so how you analyze that and how you actually organize it, how you mine it for information and science it is a new type of skill and so the fourth paradigm i do believe it is a is a really key observation of 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 where we are and the sheer scale of the data uh, and how you store it how you manage it is a new type of skill and that we need all of these now and and uh, Putting put together the experiment, putting together theory, putting together managing data. That's the challenge. And now we're trying to use um, AI and machine learning. Yes, you can do it on the simulation and modeling. You can do it on the experimental data. But really, you want to put it all together and 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 see if you can have these multimodal. So you have simulation and modeling data, you have experimental data, and you put all this together and you can analyze it uh, uh, using machine learning techniques. So it's an exciting time, and uh, the, the that was what we were doing in e-science up to 2005, uh, using traditional machine learning techniques. But of course, in 2012 came the discovery of deep learning, and that has changed things dramatically. And so that is the next chapter that we're now in. So the new data science or uh, data analysis uh, techniques are the new skills that any scientist or rather I would say any scholar today, whether you are a natural science scientist or even a historian or a, has to deal with. Uh, so there's no, I mean, you cannot escape from the uh, world of data, but it I is not, right? Yeah, because, you know, in, uh, I mean, in any field for that matter, because in history you have, for example, I'm working on a field called prosopography. It's all about, again, data, going back to then and then finding that. So data and data management, et cetera, are the key to, for any researcher today. If, yes, it, indeed. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think it's unusual that one researcher will be expert in all of these. And it is, in a sense, you know, the beginning of team science. Now, the particle physicists have huge teams of a thousand physicists and so on. So I'm not talking about that scale, but but there are on, on on a team of you know like the as we'll come to later the the deep mind team that did protein folding. They had uh, yeah. different skills. They had a team of about twenty people who worked together on the thing. And I think team science is going to be increasingly important. And um, uh, it probably started at Berkeley when they did the the, the uh, cyclotron there, where you had people who managed the cyclotron, people who took the data, people who, who, who did the analysis and experiments and theory. And so putting all that together uh, was the beginning of team science. And that's what you see. I, I work now with the US national labs, as well as the UK national lab, uh, where they have all the experimental facilities, as well as the supercomputers. And uh, putting it all together is a very challenging and exciting job to do yeah yeah the one of the main uh, component of e-science or data science is also about collaboration and the grid and all that right so the my question was primarily in this context of theories it's not the end of theory as chris anderson said in 2009 with the data deluge so theories do matter yeah no it's it's that was a ridiculous thing yes you can't just uh, go and do it Google search <laughs> data. No, it, 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 is, it isn't like that. But I, I would say, as we'll come to later, um, okay. uh, I, I, I'm concerned that librarians have slightly lost their way in that they should be, uh, I mean, a, a colleague of mine uh, at, at UC Santa Barbara said, you know, uh, scientists don't like metadata. Um, Scientists can be forced to write bad metadata, and really, 
you need to actually go and talk with experts. So I think in addition to the scientists, I think there is a role for what used to be called a subject librarian, a research librarian, to, to work with the scientists to understand what's the appropriate metadata for storing this particular data set so you can make sense you can combine it and it links of course into fair data uh, that we're coming to later on so yeah. but i do think subject librarians i think you see i i happen to think that uh, libraries are an important part of our academic system and and universities and they should be the guardians yeah. of the intellectual output of the institution and that uh you know Journals now you can get all electronically. You don't need to have huge shelving space and all that sort of stuff. But but actually, the data that's produced by the researchers, you need to have the metadata, you need to have the data sets, you need to have all the, the provenance of that yeah. data. And that's something that ideally you can have the research library look after and and, and not only have a, a, a repository for all the lecture the papers in open science papers but you also have the data uh, matching and you link the paper to the data and you link the data sets together with with the appropriate metadata and we'll come a bit to yeah. the, that as well but i i would add research librarians in there they should be there doing data management with the scientists yeah, I totally agree with you. In fact, that's one of my views, you know. Earlier, we used to focus more on the consumer end of the information cycle where, you know, you would get these journals, etc. And then you provide access to retrieve those articles. But today you focus at the creation, in, I mean, beginning of the process of research that is you know, at the creator end of the information cycle. That is where it is created and how to manage the data. And we have to move towards more towards data rather than just the information or the information resource part. Well, 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 that, that's my view. It's not popular with everybody, but but you see, I can go into my university library in Southampton where I'm a visiting professor and used to be uh, a dean of engineering. Uh, and you can go in the library, you can get a cup of coffee. There's an advertiser's coffee that you can get Wi-Fi. You can chat to your friends yeah. uh, and, and you can do work there in peace and quiet. Uh, well, my son did most of his PhD writing in Starbucks in Berkeley. And so you don't need a library to do that. And that's a good thing, having a place that students can go and convene, but that wasn't the purpose of a library. And that you can imagine now a library, which at a university that doesn't do research, that you don't have a library. You, you have all these things online and it's just a small thing of uh, that run by the computing service that you could imagine. And so I think that, that in order at, at research universities, there really is a role for the research librarians to actually participate and get to know the different skills and the different fields. Maths is very different from biology, is different from English literature and so on. And they each have different things. My, my wife is a librarian and she she was the one who uh, worked at Southampton to make uh, not only we used to have a, a repository for 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 engineering because I was dean of engineering and I insisted on that but but she make she helped make it so it worked across all the fields and you now have a university research repository which is appropriate for mathematicians which is appropriate for biologists and so on with their different philosophies of how you do it and uh, I think that's an important part, in my view, of the librarian's role in the future. Okay, we'll come back to that. So now yeah, yeah. We'll go back to AI, and especially, you know, these days, you cannot talk about AI and talk about the talk of the town that is chat GPT, because there's not a single day passes without, uh, you know, AI grabbing the headlines. Okay, And then particularly these days, everyone is talking about not only AI researchers, but also others about the, you know, uh, the impact on the future of uh, humanity. So I believe, I understand that uh, we're going back to Richard uh, Feynman again. He, after his involvement in the Manhattan Project, he suffered, he seemed to have, you know, had this existential crisis question and questioned the fate of humanity and also the evil that science could uh, bring. So today, many people are talking about, you know, the future of uh, or the existential crisis of uh, Homo sapiens, as it were. So before we go to the uh, topic of AI for science, I wanted to know your views on uh, AI in terms of is it posing an existential 
uh, threat to humanity? Well, I think it's it's actually it's a very interesting, exciting, uh, worrying. Uh, you know, all these things are, are, are true uh, it, for for the following reasons. I mean, I have here mm -hmm. just an article. Uh, large learning models are an unfortunate detour in AI. And, and it gives examples from chat GPT where you're chatting to it and the chat GPT gives a, a very plausible answer. But actually, it turns out in some of these examples that they it's completely invented uh, a publication that never existed or uh, 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 and uh, uh, research action that never happened. And you have to recognize that chat gpt is just learning languages it's natural language programming and so it learns so much stuff and then it knows when you have this set of words what's the most likely words to follow it it doesn't have any understanding of that and so it doesn't understand that putting likely words like it could be a paper on this it's not the same as actually having a paper it doesn't have any understanding of that and so it doesn't have any uh qualms about giving you an answer but the answer is not relevant because it's actually not trained to recognize that inventing references and research is not actually how you do research so it doesn't have any consciousness it doesn't have any real understanding so in in the, the, the terms of ai there used to be things like weak ai which is where computers act as if they are intelligent and i would put chat gpt in that category and strong ai where uh, the ai is actually thinking for itself and and actually has you know can can understand oh uh, such things like integrity and 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 correctness and 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 whether this is true or not it doesn't have that thing it's just these language models just know about language so they're excellent and they will replace a lot of people because they can summarize things. If you give them this information and they produce a summary, they'll produce a summary. And if you want to do this, it can do some things very well, much better than people, because computers actually don't forget and they know all the facts. And that's why, you know, it's very interesting that the latest version of Chat GPT using Chat uh, GPT three, I think it is four, uh, has passed the, the 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 legal bar exam because it is a lot about memorizing stuff and it doesn't forget and it knows all those things and it can it knows how you write an answer based on the facts it's, it, it knows. So I am concerned and I I I I I recognize the 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 importance of your question in that now you can mimic people's voices, you can mimic people's images, you can actually mimic the text that they might write, you can make them sound if they're saying it. Uh, and it's going to be very difficult to distinguish between information and disinformation. And I think that's a very, very dangerous place to be, that one doesn't know what's true, and what's not true. And having always worked in the sciences and 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 where, where actually one had a foundation of yes there were wrong experiments but they were found out by other people and so there was a, a real integrity to the data when dealt with and so on and now we we saw before with social networks the ease at which misinformation can spread and now it's much more difficult you can have you know prince charles saying something completely ridiculous joe biden saying something completely ridiculous uh, and it's a very scary future. Uh, I don't think it's 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 going to destroy humanity. F Feynman, yes, after the Los Alamos thing, yeah. he was wandering around New York saying, why, why are people building things? It's all going to go. It'll just disappear. And so it took him a long time to get over that phase. Well, I don't think we're in that stage where we have sort of um, – Armageddon and uh, where, where the whole thing is annihilated but we are going to have a very difficult phase of, of, of are there bounds that you can put on these chat GPT I do think it's probably a detour in um, in AI but it's a very dangerous one it's a bit like social networks when Tim Berners-Lee invented the web and when social networks they were a great thing you could connect with your friends you could all share your photos and things one didn't imagine the evil that you could do with them. And and I do worry that we've got many more powerful tools now with AI that you can do much more damage and much more evil with them, as well as 
good things. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's a very critical point we're at. I don't think it threatens the future of humanity, but I do feel it's it threatens, uh, you know, if you like, yeah. democracy. Because uh, I think that part of the reasons you have these 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 uh, places where you can suppress information is because you control everything yeah. and you can write the history as you like. It's very 1984-like. So it's very <laughs> yeah. scary. No, it is very scary. Yeah. yeah. And then but, I mean, don't spend time on trying to check facts and trying to, because it's also not very difficult. But people don't do that when it comes to disinformation campaign and things like that. I, it it so, is very difficult. Yeah. You, you could, I, I have a book called, which I would like to recommend to you, called The Computing Universe, where some of these things are discussed. But but that was before the deep learning revolution. So it doesn't have all of them. It has machine learning in there, of course, and it has some some comments about AI and neural networks. But but. Uh, Probably I need to produce a new edition. New edition, yes. You have another thing coming up. <laughs> okay, now let us get back to the focus of our uh, our chat today. That is your book, uh, Artificial Intelligence for Science, A Deep Learning Revolution. Of course, the book uh, sets the scene with uh, articles on uh, you know data-driven science and articles on diverse application domains uh, from uh, you know astronomy energy health etc and of course it also includes a section on the ecosystem uh, of ai for science see the my first question in this regard is of course the main thing is that ai the power of ai rests with its ability to analyze and interpret humongous amount of data quickly and supposedly accurately. So the question is, well, as far as speed is concerned, I think everyone can agree that that speed is something that we cannot even imagine or we cannot match. But the question is about the accuracy. What do the contributors in your book, you know, who are stalwarts in their own domain, say about the accuracy part of the uh, you know ai for data analysis and interpretation and you also have co-authored an article in the same book called the title the benchmarking for ai for science could you elaborate on that too i could yes um okay so yes you're quite right i mean uh, part of the challenge uh, is understanding the accuracy of these models. If you're using these models, they're like a black box. We don't fully understand exactly how they work. Uh, and we need really to have confidence in the results. You need to understand how they how they come about with the, with the, with the answers. And, and that uh, we need to challenge. And so a black box, it doesn't have the traditional error bars when you do an experiment. Uh, the traditional methods, you measure it many times and you can do a, a, a statistical analysis of what the likely uh, the answer is, but also with an error bar that this measurement is this, but the, the errors are possible either side. Uh, and that doesn't come with these neural networks. So, but what you can do is, 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 is uncertainty quantification. So it's a bit like when you do an, an ensemble measurement. So you do it many times uh, with slightly different parameters and you can come up with the with the spread. So there's a whole field now of uncertainty quantification. And in the book, uh, you'll find that an article by um, a particle physicist from Los Alamos, um, Tanmoy Bhattacharya, mm -hmm. uh, who actually talks about uncertainty quantification. Uncertainty. Uh, Quantification. Okay. So that that that's that's the the, the buzz word for it. Um, uncertainty of quantification in AI for science is one of the articles in the book, and it does tell you what you can do. But I agree, it's not totally satisfactory, and people are looking at you know how can you understand from a physics approach what these neural networks give you, and we've made some progress. I don't think we've. Um, uh, solve the problem yet uh, to everybody's satisfaction. So I think there's plenty of work to be done, but but errors are, are complicated. So, so uncertainty uh, quantification could be one way to look at the. I mean, to manage the accuracy problem. Is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, it's it's a bit like with 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 weather forecasting. Weather forecasting is. It, can be chaotic, which means that you make a tiny little change in the initial conditions and you get something totally different at the end. And so 
what they do in weather forecasting, they do an ensemble where they do multiple initial conditions and you take an average and you can see that the majority go this way and then some of them go up here and some of them go down but the majority go in one direction so uh uncertainty of quantification is a bit like that uh, and we will see progress in that space and i think we need to have confidence in the predictions of these neural networks and i don't think it's 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 quite clear at the moment it's it's very exciting um the the other thing i would say is that um what what these models show is correlations rather than causations and and that's another thing that you know it can be correlated with with something but doesn't mean to say that, that causes that but but it that these two events happen together doesn't mean that one causes the other necessarily uh okay so what about the benchmarks Benchmark. well uh when you look now at these models there are all sorts of models you can use to try and analyze your data and so you have your data and which model should you use and 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 typically scientists have been working on science rather than on a neural network topologies and things and so what we've been trying to do is to use some significantly large data sets more than a terabyte for example uh, of data uh, and to make it an open data set with metadata preferably fair uh, and from that uh, see how you can use a particular machine learning method particular deep learning topology network and so on to get a result and you can see uh, what we do is we give the data, we give the algorithm, an example algorithm where we give the code and uh, the results you can run on, on this machine, on that machine and whatever. And, and you can do the traditional things like see how fast it is or how slow it is on this machine. But you can also see how accurate it is and, and whether it it it, it uh does what you think it's going to do and are there better algorithms that can get the, the physics answer that you want the science answer and so it, it's an open set of benchmarks which people can download and it, it, we call them at the rutherford lab where i work the scientific machine learning benchmark cyml uh, as we abbreviate and you can download these things and you can try them for yourself and you can say well actually i think i can do better i can use a different algorithm i can do it this way and that gives you some understanding about how you use these things give you some confidence that 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 these things actually uh, are manageable and you can understand sufficient about the theory to be able to analyze your own data so it's an attempt to encourage people to 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 see which is the best algorithm to get most science out of your data set and that's what we would like to make it possible for people to do so we've done that uh, and we're also part of an international consortium which mm -hmm. is called ML Commons, uh, which is run by industry, but we're a small science working group. And, and we're not only interested in whether it runs best on this machine or that machine, which is what they care about, uh, but we care about what is the best algorithm for getting the science out that we know is there. Is it this algorithm or that algorithm and, and, and so on? So we, we have sort of science-based parameters that we try and measure. Uh, so there are some efforts to manage the accuracy problem and there are you have talked about the benchmarks for uh, regarding uh, AI for uh, science. Now moving on to the application domains of AI in science. I mean all of us, everyone is interested in health and the most important application or domain area is uh, health. And I see that there are two, particularly two articles in your book. One article dealing with AI and pathology, steering the treatment and the prediction, uh, predicting outcomes, and another on about the role of AI in epidemiological modeling. Of course, epidemiological modeling, especially since uh, COVID uh, pandemic, you know, not just the researchers, everyone seems to be uh, interested in the modeling, epidemiological modeling. So coming back to this, uh, what are you or what are your authors uh, say about the latest trends in steering the treatment and predicting the outcomes as well as in epidemiological modeling? 
Okay, well, the first example you gave about AI and pathology, it's about um, trying to understand the, the very detailed images that you can take now. And previously, all sorts of computer science techniques were used to analyze to, the image to say this is a significant point you can you can draw contours around this is the nucleus of the cell this is this is not and this is the the membrane or whatever so you can identify elements in the picture and they had all these these uh whole variety of computer science tools and what what what, what that article shows that they've essentially thrown away all those computer vision tools that they used to use until a few years ago and that's been replaced by these deep learning neural networks and they do much better at, at, at identifying and, and and being able to pick out pieces of an image and um jeffrey hinton one of the uh, the godfathers of all this deep learning neural networks said you know well, obviously we shouldn't be training radiographers now because computers can do it better i don't think that's quite here yet and i think that's a little bit uh, a little bit of a cavalier statement but nonetheless with image analysis there really is great progress in actually being able to uh, identify for example tumors better in some cases than train people so that's that's I think that what is clear, they will certainly supplement people. They may replace them in the end, but because uh, they don't get tired, they can go on f for days, uh, and you have to, you don't have to pay them, you don't have to feed them, and so there are real challenges in this in this industry. Um, okay, so that's that. So images. So in it's, the it's, image it's, analysis, is it the quantum of data, or is it the uh, analysis and the Modeling that is more uh, the key to this. Well, 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 this this is this is the the uh, yes. When you have an image which can be have very very high resolution, so it's very large. Uh, but to do that, that's perfect for a neural net. That's how these deep neural networks were found with with the uh, original uh, uh, project by Fei Fei Li uh, when she did uh, this image net competition. Uh, so. For images, image analysis, deep learning is really good, and you can uh, do better, at, or at least as well uh, as humans, at identifying this is a possible tumor, breast cancer tumor, or whatever. So for doing image, uh, uh, the way that doctors analyze images, uh, they're very good and will certainly have a major role. There's no doubt about that. On the broader thing you talk about, uh, let me give give you one example. Uh, one of the things I do uh, is I'm chairing a committee of the U.S. Department of Energy who are working with the National Cancer Institute in the U.S. and using supercomputers uh, as well as data to try and uh, uh, make progress on cancer. So one of the things is a rather interesting one. They have these repositories around the U.S. in most states called SEER repositories, S-E-E-R. I forget exactly what they stand for, but the records of all the deaths uh, from cancer in each state. And so you have the doctor's notes and, and, and uh, you have all this information about what they died of and so on. And what, what they've been doing is converting those notes, handwritten notes, to searchable uh, text in the computer using natural language processing methods. And that's now been successful. And now you can actually therefore search much more easily and understand all the uh, different types of pathologies that you see for this particular cancer or that cancer and so on. And so that's now up and running. And it's now these techniques, these automated techniques, so where you can convert these handwritten notes into into text that you can search, uh, is now available in these 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 major repositories in most of the states in the U.S. And that's going to have a major impact in our understanding of of of, of what the trends are and what, and what 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 the the likely outcomes are uh, uh, for various types of cancer. So that's one example that that uh, is not in the book, but but that's one of the ones I'm involved in myself. Um, uh, the, the article you pick out is, is obviously 
uh, very interesting given the fact of our recent pandemic. And yes, a lot of people also at the US DOE labs have been working on applying these techniques to uh, COVID and, and looking at uh, various ways of uh, addressing COVID and, and perhaps finding vaccines or, or drugs to 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 uh, alleviate the, the problem. So I think there is a lot of pro promise there. I'm not an expert in epidemiology, but 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 I do believe that that's going to be a major area of, of uh, analysis. And it's it's a much more obvious one that they will be using AI to assist the doctor. Uh, there was a uh, there was a stage some years ago with IBM uh, Watson uh, had a, 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 a program to work with doctors and, and it did not in the end turn out so well because the doctors didn't have confidence in the machine that they understood where it got its predictions from. So I think there is there are some challenges here too uh, and we'll see exactly how you can give confidence for the computers to be able to work with doctors. Uh, one one of my heroes is a guy named JCR Licklider. Yeah. Uh, he, he 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 was the one who had the vision, uh, not only for the library of the future, but 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 also he had a vision for the networks for the and the the, the what became the internet started as a thing called the ARPANET, uh, and and he had that, that vision. But he also was at MIT. He was professor of psychology there. Uh, and you had people like Marvin Minsky and people who all thought that AI was going to be super intelligent and goth by itself. His vision of AI was, he wrote a paper called The Human Computer Symbiosis, that, yeah. that actually working with an AI system with a, with a person can A, speed up what the person can do, but also you can have a dialogue and, and, and it, it really is a partnership. And that, to me, seems a much more encouraging vision of how AI in the future rather than something which is totally independent and doesn't have any input from from people. So I, I would like to see that, whether that's the case, or maybe I'm being um, over-optimistic, but, but I think that's a more likely scenario than, uh, you know, than intelligent systems like R2-D2 or whatever it is coming and talking to you. I, I, I suspect that's rather unlikely. Although you will see robotic help in care homes uh, and there will be simple robotics, but there will not be intelligent things that can generate their own uh, thoughts and information. Let's hope so. And then I also believe, you know, so many people, you know, are working towards managing this. So we will find a solution about, you know, in the direction in which uh, the AI will go, just as, and of course, uh, in case of... Uh, Autumn uh, bomb, it was a different kind of a existential crisis. But we also saw, uh, I mean, a couple of years uh, ago, five, four or five years ago in genetics or gen, uh, gene editing, etc., and how we are going to have designer babies and all that. But we did somehow manage that, uh, I think, that period with, uh, I mean, a government, people coming together and then, you know, pausing some research and taking the di right direction, I would say. So I... No, yeah, yes, I, I, I agree. Uh, I mean, I don't think we've quite solved the atomic bomb problem and I don't think we've solved the CRISPR problem quite, yeah, but, quite. But, but it does seem to be not as uh, as serious at this moment, uh, but... but uh, no, it's, it's it's scary technologies that you can do things. I mean, it, it's true. And now you have AI, which uh, I don't think... Uh, will will have all these worst fears, but I do think the 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 fact that you can't tell something real uh, from a fake is is a very serious thing for disinformation, and I think we will need to do things about that. Yeah. Maybe we need a blue tick like Twitter, but maybe. <laughs> and we see what is happening with the blue tick. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, we have to. We'd have to make a system work, unlike. The Blue tick for Twitter. <laughs> anyway, now coming back to another, you know, excitement about AI advancements, etc., is the DeepMind's Alpha Four, which is uh, supposed to be a game changer, right? And there is an article in your book on Alpha Find, uh, sorry, Alpha Fold, the end of a protein folding problem or the start of something bigger. So can yeah. you share, you know, what is the state of the art when it comes to uh, alpha fold? 
Well, it really has done remarkable things. First of all, one must congratulate Google's deep mind for doing this uh, and also uh, for making the, res the code available and making uh, explaining. And, and I think my colleague at the University of Washington here where I am, David Baker, take some credit for that because I, he firmly believed you you shouldn't be able to publish if you didn't actually tell you exactly how you got the answers so making the code available was important uh, and I think they've done that and they've also um, so other people now using it and I'll come back to that in just a moment uh, but they also made a lot of predictions for ones that uh, proteins whose structure has not been solved so they put a whole huge number of 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 uh, protein structures which they predict using alpha fold which are now available at uh, uh, EMBL and, and I think in the US as well uh, uh, and, and this is a laboratory for people to use and and I was just reading the latest edition of my communications of the ACM this is uh, volume six it, it, it was last month anyway um, and the heading is alpha fold spreads through protein science. So people are now taking alpha fold, improving it. They're taking it. They're adding other things to it and, and, and trying to, to, to see if they can uh, improve the predictions in the areas for some of the proteins where it was a little fuzzy. They've actually now made major improvements so this is being adopted by the community it's there's a thing called open fold which is an open source version of that which also gives some tools for the for the for the biologists uh, and and uh what is particularly interesting that might interest you is that there is uh there is now an attempt to actually combine that with the uh, large language model approach so people have been doing what's called um PLMs, protein language models, uh, and although they're not at the moment by themselves as accurate as AlphaFold, putting them together, I think, is where we will see in the, in the future. So computer scientists are working with biologists on uh, combining traditional AlphaFold um, deep learning methods, but adding to it other things, including, for example, these uh, large language language models like chat gpt i think they've actually used something called bert which was google's version right. uh, of, of large language models so uh, i think there's a lot of activity and it's it it's as the article in the book david jones and janet thornton uh, david jones was one of the people in the original alpha fold project janet thornton is the director of the european bio uh, bioinformatics institute uh, as a which is a, a substation of of the EMBL uh, and is based near Cambridge. Uh, they, they've spent their lives doing protein folding, so they give a, a picture of where we are, what, what what hasn't been done yet, and, and and look towards all the possible applications. And I was very interested in this in this paper, which actually shows that AlphaFold, because it's been open sourced, is now being improved and taken up and looked at lots of different things. They haven't solved all of them. They they certainly won the competition and and there's, there's a statement that they don't think they can go much further because they've they've solved solved that but they haven't solved it in all cases with all different types of molecules and so I think there's a lot of activity being generated and I think it will continue to be and um, in the book I showed just one of the protein folding predictions for one of the COVID proteins they 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 also did that too. So that was uh, uh, why I think that's a particularly exciting area uh, for understanding more about um, the proteins and how they work in the in the body. And I just want to share one. Just a couple of days back, you know, about protein folding, I asked Chat GPT, name ten recent breakthroughs in protein folding. Guess what? It did not mention. Deep Minds uh, Alpha Fold. It, it is not. Said 10 things. It did not mention neither the Deep Mind nor the Alpha Fold. Then I said, What about Deep Mind Alpha Fold? Oh, yes, sorry about that. And then it makes it. <laughs> That's really very yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I have captured that it is with me <laughs> anyway. So no, that's a very. It, it, yeah, no. <laughs> It's clear that uh, ChatGPT is not the final answer, but uh, 
but it's also clear that it needs a few guidelines and and has to be uh, improved uh, and it's an interesting there's a dichotomy in the computer science community that people want to have a pause while we think about what we're going to do or what the approach that really um elon musk took to um self-driving cars mm -hmm. which was basically yeah. to use drivers as experimentalists you know you release this stuff and see how it goes yeah a few people get killed but you know <laughs> uh, you can improve the software uh, that may be slightly harsh but 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 that's in some sense what what microsoft and, and open ai are doing with chat gpt they know it's not perfect and they're releasing it and just seeing you know what what the good things and the bad things now that could be a rather dangerous thing to do but we will see but it is if you like an open experiment where they're experimenting with the thing but but how you put it back in the bag after you've done it uh, the only thing is that in order to develop these models one of my concerns uh is that we have open we have AlphaFold, and we now have open ai with these these large language models uh, and large language models uh, are trained on huge amounts of data and and uh, AlphaFold, the original AlphaFold uses use hundreds of millions of computing uh, dollars uh, in order to get it done and sim similarly with these uh, large language models they use up maybe you know hundreds of millions of, of computing power which are not available to academics so the research scientists cannot duplicate we can't train our model on data that uh, we want we only have to accept what they've trained it on and that, for example they may omit everything about alpha fold i don't know right but uh, uh, <laughs> i don't think that's the case yeah. but um, but 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 you see it, uh, there are now two efforts one in the us called the national ai research resource which is actually trying to make with nsf and department of energy uh, could they have some machines that would allow people to experiment significantly with ai uh, in a way that was affordable by academics uh, if the government could offer resources and and since the u.s department of energy labs have supercomputers for example it's not even the one that's the fastest one, but but Summit Computer at, at, at Oak Ridge has uh, something like 30,000 NVIDIA chips in it. And so you could use that as a resource for doing uh, uh, open AI type calculations for chat GPT, so GPT calculations. And that would be a, a resource that could be used by other people because they now have the first exascale computer at the lab which is called frontier so with the with the machine that is no longer the first machine summit you could use it for doing ai calculations and in the uk there's a similar effort uh to try and persuade the government this is something we really need to do for our national uh, security and for our national uh competitiveness is to have a resource that people can actually go and uh, do different things than we're, we're given these models it would be nice to be able to produce your own models or different models or do different things and at the moment you can't do that yeah it rests with these big corporations right yeah that's right no i'm i'm as an ex-microsoft employee i'm naturally sympathetic to microsoft <laughs> uh, but, uh, but they have invested a large amount yeah, of money that's in true. in the things and and that would not be feasible for for normal people or normal companies so uh, and in fact the european union always laments the fact that you know you have all these american companies uh, and it, there isn't a, a european cloud company well that's quite simple because in order to build the 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 number of data centers you have to have a global coverage you need billions and billions and billions of dollars and not many european companies are in that league no no european company could could do what google facebook and microsoft have been doing in building data centers around the world so so it, it's it's a challenge yeah so now we are running out of time so let us come back to the yes, other I'm sorry, yes. that we have that no no it's i also have been adding to this <laughs> mm. okay delay uh, so uh, apart from ai for science which we have discussed uh, quite uh, i mean i would say briefly of course uh, let's talk about the ecosystem for the and also the infrastructure for 
uh, AI for science because they are equally important, which, of course, Jim Gray made a compelling case for funding the data infrastructure. And metadata is a critical is critical for scientific uh, data management. So my question is, how far have we come regarding the machine actionability of the FAIR principles, the capacity yeah. of the computational systems to find, access, interoperate, and reuse data? Yes, uh, no, and that's, uh, I mean, all governments have signed up to uh, research agencies. Fair, it sounds great. You want data to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Everybody will agree to that. Um, uh, but it's it's more than just a standard format, all right, uh, is what they want. They want you to be able to actually, uh, with these data sets, to go to look at the, the metadata and the machine to look at it and and act on it and say, well, this is obviously the same as that, and we can put them together and and they, they and so on. Uh, and so they want actionable metadata. Well, um, uh, and there is a, a traditional way of doing that, which which was uh, pioneered by the computer scientists to get semantic information along with data, which uses semantic web technologies, which are things like RDF, uh, like uh, programming language, OWL, like Sparkle, and, and, and all these tools, which are, are rather computer science-y, and I'm not sure how accessible they are to the majority of scientists. Uh, it's true that in biology, they have actually made great progress at, in that. And so... Um, on the metadata thing, uh, you really want to add some semantic information. And, and that's why it brings me to your next question, which was to do with um, standards uh, 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 and uh, metadata. Uh, and one of the, when I was at Microsoft, the only thing that Microsoft uh, and Google ever agreed in was uh, schema.org. And schema.org was 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 a mechanism for adding a small amount of information of semantic information to a website. You could put it very easily in your website. Put some little little uh, uh, very simple things in your code, and and then the search engine could look for this and say, when you're looking for uh, Casablanca, right? Traditional example of mine now i happen to like casablanca the movie but casablanca the place is in north africa and so um you would like to know the website you're looking at it's got casablanca in the title is that the data set you want to to give people um well you you'd like to be able to know that the search engine would say this is about a city in north africa this is about humphrey bogart's movies all right and and that's what this will allow you to do so you put a small amount of information in schema.org which was this 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 sort of additional information that you can put into your web site which makes it much more findable therefore uh, because you can find it and you can also understand that you find the right site which, which not the one about the town, but about the movies or whatever you want to do. And you can find the actor and you can find the director and things like that. You can put lots of other tags in there. Not, not a huge amount, but enough that you can get some definite knowledge about what, what, what that site's about, as opposed to just looking at keywords. Uh, and uh, that also uh, is makes possible the I in FAIR because... Uh, with that, you can pick that up with the, with the, with the machine, and you can actually do some operations on it without human intervention. So schema.org allows you to do that. Uh, and what you can do with schema.org, it has a certain vocabulary, but you're allowed, if your community wants to, to put in a proposal to extend that vocabulary to biology, to chemistry, to physics, to whatever. And and so then you can have a a, a you can search on items which are not just the ones they've given you, but the ones that are relevant to your field. Now, it won't be the whole thing that you would have if you did the full semantic web, but it will give you some semantic information. And that's where AI comes in, in AI and semantics, in this case, understanding actually what the database, what the data sets are about. And so putting a little bit of information. Um, and so the article in the book is about a, 
a biology community, bio biology community called Bioschemas is the article where they've actually introduced into schema.org some elements of their particular vocabulary so they can search for data sets which are particularly relevant to their community rather than just picking up a title and that's beginning of semantic information now the people who uh, are, are zealots if you like will say oh well you're missing all this other information you and that's true um you could get much more but the difficulty is i don't know that you'll get oceanographers uh particle physicists chemists and so on writing their data sets with rdf formats research data formats and and i think that having something that is actually practical and gives you some information is better than having a very uh, you know, uh, ambitious scheme, which very few people use. And that's my particular worry. And and the other worry is that um, once you say we're going to adopt FAIR, there will be people who, and you, you can already find them now, who, who can measure how FAIR is your data. And so you can have, if you like, what I call the FAIR police, who will actually say, oh, your data is not fair, you haven't fulfilled your, and will report you to your funding agency. And I worry about that, because uh, some of these people are, if you like, they want the full semantic web. And I think that's uh, maybe down the line, but at least yeah. make a start by, uh, and what we're doing is taking the ontology, but the small part of it, and putting it in schema.org. So it's very related to what they were doing, but it isn't actually the whole lot. And I think it makes it much easier. It's it's a much more manageable technology uh, and the tools that are available to interrogate it and, and, and so on are much easier to use. So we, we will see. But that's my personal view that, that you need to make it so people can put some semantic information in. And schema.org has been agreed by all the major search engines. So it actually is something you can go and search for. And Google have a data set search, for example, and these these are picked up by their data set search. So is it again like the small rabbits winning the race or, you know, like the open community model, right? So the open community model of the schema.org also is one of the reasons for its uh, success. Would you say that? Yeah. Yes, I, I would. Yes, I, I mean, it, it, it is managed by a consortium of the World Wide Web. It isn't actually a World Wide Web standard, but but they manage it. And and yes, you can have extensions by different communities. And I think that's very important. And I think it's a it's a way forward that we can actually improve our search knowledge and, and, and so on. So uh, it may be unnecessary if we have. Uh, like Bing have now got Chat GPT incorporated, and maybe Bing will and Chat GPT will make it all in, irrelevant. But I doubt it, and I think that using something like Schema.org, which is widely accepted, uh, and being able to extend it for different communities so they can use it uh, and and use simple tools to access uh, and write the, the 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 code is very important. And I think that actually is something that research librarians should be expert in data management. So sorry about that, Shalini. I think that's uh, <laughs> nice for yeah, you to I do. Know. I understand your concern and your rant. <laughs> yeah, I do that. <laughs> so coming to my last question, the final question, we began with uh, Feynman and I'm going to end with Feynman also. Uh, one of the, according to Feynman, the greatest value of science is the freedom it provides us to doubt. Do you think that AI has this capability to doubt? How do we yes, inject so, that? Yeah, no, I, 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 uh, I've been reading a lot about Feynman lately because of this, the book I've just finished, mm -hmm. uh, the new edition. But, but uh, yeah, Feynman, there's a nice biography by Gleck. Uh, who who ends with you know Feynman believed in the supremacy of doubt not as a blemish on knowing but but as the essence of knowledge or something like that uh, and it, it's a very it's it's very true so what about AI I find that very difficult all right uh, AI at the moment doesn't to my knowledge fit in that model because uh Feynman's view of science was everything is 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 provisional. So Newton's laws, 
they, they were the best we could do. They summarized a huge amount of the data we had in the world, but they don't work when you get to high velocities and you have to go to Newton, to uh, uh, relativity and Einstein. Um, uh, so that in that sense, that's what Feynman believed, that, that, you know, these are the things that work up to now, but they may not be the things that are correct in the future, you know, uh, in the long term. And AI, I don't think it's... it's yeah, it's, it's that's a very good question. I'm not sure I have a very good answer to it. Um, uh, that's okay. I mean, maybe we can end with that question, you know, that we yeah, don't indeed, have answers. Indeed. And probably our hope lies there, right? Because the science, the essence of humanity may be to have that ability to doubt. And maybe AI doesn't have that ability, may not have that ability. And maybe that's for good. I don't, we don't know yet, right? <laughs> No, but 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 I, but I worry about these these deep fakes that you can now make yeah. uh, that that they, they end up we doubt everything and that seems to me a wrong thing to do yeah. so I don't quite uh, let me let me think I'll come back to you in a in a year's time and I'll give you okay. an answer so we'll have another chat a year's time now okay okay good on that note and that positive note and hope let's uh, say thank you and then thank you so much you have been very generous with your time as well as giving me this opportunity once again uh, we will uh, meet somewhere sometime okay that would be very nice